Um, I've been here in Warwickshire, thinking about Warwickshire for just a little bit over two years, and it was very apparent almost from as soon as, um, almost from day one, that Warwickshire was extremely fortunate um, and very proud of the knowledge about um, the county, <coughs> about which habitats occur where, about which species occur where, about the condition of some of those habitats, and um, blow me down, um, how some of those habitats were connected to each other. And I think 20 years ago, um, looking at the, the black and white photos that are all over there, it would have been hard to imagine um, that two decades on from that time, uh, that we would be in the position of knowing so much about Warwickshire, about the natural environment. Terms such as ecosystem services and natural capital hadn't been coined then, um, probably only just beginning to be starting and uh, to be thought about. I mean, 20 years ago, um, I was working for the United Nations Environment Programme, and the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment uh, was just sort of, uh, 20 years ago in 1996, was sort of just coming you know, through, and, you know, at the turn of the millennium, we should perhaps start thinking about these things. Um, but here we are in Warwickshire, um, I think I'm on safe ground in saying, in an unparalleled position within the United Kingdom, in knowing about our local patch and the, uh, the, 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 the services and the capital that nature provides to the people who live here. And that is really what we're celebrating, and that is through the very hard work of everybody who's worked on the HPA and the foresight that the people who set it up, um, some of whom are in the room today, um, had at that time. So we salute you, and in my position, um, we thank you as well. So I'm going to hand over now straight away to Steve to come and say a few words as well. Steve, of course, I'm sure most people know, was Chief Executive here up until two years ago. Well, uh, thank you very much, Shed. And um, can I first of all say a massive thank you for inviting me. It's absolutely brilliant to be here because the HBA, I would echo everything that Eddie said, the HBA is a shining example to the rest of England and the UK in terms of how to collect vital data that's important for all sorts of reasons, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, I really just wanted to spend my, my, my time talk, trying to set the achievements that you will achieve together um, in a bit of context really, and to talk a bit about some of the challenges that are to come and why the data and information that uh, the partnership behind the HPA and its staff and volunteers are, are producing is so relevant, so important for the future. For the future benefit not only of um, nature conservation, which is critical, but also because of the you know, the, the, the consequence it has for wider society and for people's health and well-being, for business and for the economy uh, and our general sustainability. So those, I won't read those out, those are the kind of topics I'm going to try and cover uh, fairly briefly. For those that aren't familiar with Wildlife Trust, um, just to give a bit, a bit of background as to where I'm coming from. Um, as I said, I'm the uh, recently appointed director of England, so I'm our response to devolution uh, within the Wildlife Trust movement. Uh, which may be coming on here well <laughs> last week, uh, Scotland and Ireland break away. Um, but essentially, Wildlife Trust um, are a federated network of 47 individual and independent trusts like the Warwickshire Trust. Uh, and we have something of the order of 840,000 members, uh, about 95,000 hectares of uh, land that we look after, either owning or uh, managing. And uh, we have some about 45,000 volunteers working across across the UK, uh, which gives us you know, an amazing perspective uh, on the natural environment. And I think the key thing about the Wildlife Trust is that we're kind of basically local. We're, unlike other many other NGOs, we're not top down, we're bottom up. Um, so I'm, I'm based in um, Newark, and we have a small team of about 35 people working at the centre of the Wildlife Trust. I think. The more important perspective is those is what's happening to our, our natural environment and what's happening to our species and our habitats more widely. And I'm sure many of you in this room are familiar with um, much of the, the the data information that's been collated and shared and promulgated over the last few years. Particularly the uh, the groundbreaking State of Nature report, which brought 25 voluntary organisations together to, sh to share data and put together new data sets in a way that haven't been done before. And um, 
much of that data comes from local environment, environmental records centres and organisations like the HPA and the kind of work that you're, the information that you're collecting. And the stats, I think everybody in this room is, I think, is familiar with the kind, of the, the kind of general picture. It's an ongoing, depressing story. These are the kind of headline stats. 6% of just over 3,000 UK species are in decline, have declined over the last 50 years. Many very strongly. Um, we've created a new watch list indicator, which I know several people in the room have been involved in. Steve, I know, has been involved behind, in, in, the, in developing the work behind these tables and graphs. Uh, but it's all very depressing, a depressing story that, you know, we have a problem out there that we're not really managing, we're not looking after our landscapes in a way that many species require <coughs> to do. And even at a habitat level, you know, only 37% of our SSSIs, our special scientific, scientific interests, which are supposed to be the jewels in the crown, these are the cathedrals of nature conservation, only 37% of them are assessed as being in good condition. Uh, and again, you know, whichever, this is, these are the official government stats that you're probably familiar with. Um, and it's a, it's a familiar, depressing story that you know, things are going wrong. Once familiar species that were cherished by most of us, the water, you know, water bowls and hedgehogs, as you know, and here in Warwickshire, from all the work that you've been doing, um, you know, in decline. Who would have thought that the, the hedgehog was in decline at the same, at a, at a faster rate than tigers are declining internationally? So uh, it's all very depressing. And again, many of you will be aware of the local stats um, in terms of, you know, within the county, we're seeing significant decline in a whole range of species. And if, whichever group you take and look at, virtually all of them are in trouble. And this, this is data from Stephen's book, um, The Watch of Flora. So, you know, we've lost 76 species, mostly since the 50s and 60s. And I know in conversation with Stephen, you know, you know that's, those are the headline figures, but if you look at beyond that, you know, 200, 300 other rarer local species in Warwickshire, you know, they're all declining. So, things are going wrong. Uh, oh, what do you think that is? That's <laughs> probably. Well, you can't have to be. Good. <laughs> um, so, one thing we've got to be very careful of is getting too depressed and getting into quite a negative state. And actually, where we take the effort, where we invest the time and the energy and the money and the resources, we can turn things around, whether it's at a habitat level or a species level. And there are great success, success stories. I mean, in the Otter, in Warwickshire nationally, you know, red kites. Um, you know, the recovery of things like silver wash, fertility, butterfly, now some of this may be due to climate, but it's also because we've spent the time, you know, people in this county and volunteers have spent the time getting habitats right and getting habitats into con good condition. Um, you know, that we can turn these things around if we invest the time and the energy. Um, and, you know, if we look in detail more closely at the key issues, which are, you know, it's, a, it's all about ongoing habitat loss, land use change and intensification, Pollution in some places, over exploitation of natural resources, um, invasive species, and fragmentation and development are all kind of themes. And one I would add to that is neglect as well, actually. Sometimes it's about neglect. Um, so, what do, we do, what do we do about it? And there's been a lot of thinking going on in conservation for a number of years now about how do we turn around these declines. And the evidence points to quite a simple picture and that traditionally we've seen nature as being stuck over there in a reserve behind the fence and it's okay. But actually, now that we're understanding the way that populations of species work and interact, it's becoming increasingly apparent that we've got to look much more widely than that at a landscape scale to, sh to look at how species are connected and how habitats are connected. Um, and it's the 10th year actually, since 2006, the Wildlife Trust in particular, have been championing this concept of living landscapes. And here in Warwickshire, the Trust has developed some really fantastic projects with partners um, around the Tame Valley and the um, Prince Thorpe Woodlands, to name but two. Um, and this, this has really been taken up uh, very widely by a whole range of people. And the, the seminal work on this, and I would recommend if you haven't done so already, do read the document, Making Space for Nature. This is something that's become known in the jargon as the Lawton Review, which was published in 2010. It's 
commissioned by Hillary Benn in the last Labour government, um, but then adopted and taken on board by Caroline Spellman, who couldn't, it's a shame she couldn't be here today because she does, deserves a lot of credit for the work she did in that. Um, but this was a seminal piece of work really that brought together top scientists, all the evidence, and had a thorough, thorough review of what we needed to do as a, a nation if we're going to turn around the, the decline in our natural environment and water. And um, again, I make no apologies every time I do slides for these days. So this has almost become a bit of a visual cliche showing this diagram, but I've, it's worth showing again because it, it's still relevant, still valid, and it still holds true. Um, but it kind of summarises what we need to do. Really. We need more space for wildlife, we need bigger areas for wildlife, we need better managed areas for wildlife, and we need them to be joined up if we're going to reverse some of these, these declines that we're seeing. It all starts with <coughs> the core areas. So the, the basic concept is that you know we have a network across the country, across Warwickshire, core sites. But whether they're sites of special scientific interest and designated, we have very, unfortunately very few European sites in Warwickshire. Uh, or whether they're local wildlife sites or just important, important pieces, patches of land. We, these are the building blocks, really, if you like, the building blocks for, for nature's recovery and for re reversing the, the, de the decline. So this is where most of our wildlife currently, currently resides. And because of the work that the HPA does, you know more about this in Warwickshire, I think, than almost any other county that I can think of. And having been around quite a lot of counties, I now see that you know, just how valuable the resource you have here in terms of data and information. It's, uh, it's almost unparalleled. Well, it is unparalleled. So you know where your core areas are. <coughs> um, and, you know, as I mentioned before, uh, these are the SSSIs, of which there, there aren't enough in Warwickshire. Um, uh, but lots and lots of local wildlife sites. Um, again, which the HBA is, is part of a partnership uh, for local wildlife sites have been instrumental in providing the data with which to identify this network of core sites. And I can't overemphasise over, how important that information is so you know where your good places are. And there's a nationally there's a real issue with local wildlife sites. Again, this is where most of our wildlife resides now in the UK. And they're kind of undervalued. Not many people know about them. Um, even fewer people value them. They're, they're not protected in law, so you know, they're, you know, in terms of planning, they're a material consideration in planning decisions, but they're not, you know, they're not a, uh, a perceived blockage to development or growth or anything like that. Um, but, and we really need to find ways of in increasing the value and increasing the way that we look at them, because um, the surveys that we've been doing, the last survey uh, was back in 2014, and something like 10%, nearly 11% of wildlife sites in, the, in England had either been lost or degraded significantly um, within a 10 year period between 2000, I think it was 2002 and 2012, which is quite a shocking statistic, um, particularly bearing in mind their importance to local people and to local wildlife. Um, we do really need to start shouting about how important these, these sites are. And as I say, the HPA has been instrumental in John and the team's work has been, the volunteers' work has been instrumental in identifying your network of really important places for wild species. I would also add it's not always just about development and direct loss. That does happen, and I know you've had cases in Warwickshire um, of direct loss, um, either through planning or development, but it's also the big issue, the other big issue seems to be neglect. So. Um, because people don't understand or value these sites, that many of them have you know, not been grazed or managed in the way that's conducive to their mm. nature conservation interests. And that's as big an issue, I think, as development, maybe. So, you know, it's these kind of places that perhaps have fallen out of the SSSI network. Um, and let's not forget, sites of special scientific interest are not meant to be a fully comprehensive network of protected sites. They're only supposed to represent a selection, a broad band, so a broad selection of the best sites that we have in the UK. And Dave, where's Dave? Dave was just saying to me a moment ago that I think in Warwickshire we're now down to, did you say 105 hectares of grassland like this outside this is the size? Which, 
which when there were, there were tens of thousands of hectares of this kind of habitat in Warwickshire just 30, 40, 50 years ago. It's quite astonishing that we could, be, that we could, we could have less than 100 hectares um, left within the county in just a year or two. So the core principle is get your core sites into good condition, look after them, protect them. But then uh, join them up oops, through a series of corridors, stepping stones, buffers, try and make your, your core sites bigger and better, join them up and add new sites and create new sites wherever possible. And um, it's interesting to see the, uh, the work starting on the, the gravel extraction over the road. But you know, one way of looking at developments is maybe that actually, you know, the, the, the objective may, may, may be to create a massive new wetland extension to Brandon Marsh. Oh, and on the way to achieve it, we've got to extract a bit of gravel. So you know, perhaps sometimes we need to take a more positive and a slightly different approach to the way we engage with uh, growth and design. So you know, increasingly important is looking after not only the coal sites, but the bits in between. So you know, how do species move between coal sites, corridors, and it's becoming increasingly important recognise that hedges and hedgerow trees are absolutely vital as stepping stones for species as they move around the landscape. And there's an increasing body of ecological evidence showing that just how crucial they are to the to the way that populations of species use the landscape. And they look good. So you know hopefully we're going to be able to you know using the data that the HPA has collected start to plan and map out exactly where we need to put this infrastructure to green infrastructure to make sure we uh, I won't rebuild this out but you know ecological connectivity is vital for biodiversity for all the reasons I've, I've mentioned um, but the matrix the kind of wider landscape is also important so the more we can do to get um, to improve the welcome that species get in the wider countryside the kind of it's sometimes termed in the jargon as the permeability of the wider landscape is absolutely critical as well. And of course, fragmentation and connectivity is absolutely critical. And this is a, an HPA map from a couple of years ago showing, you know, just emphasizing the point that how fragmented our landscapes are. And without this information, you know, how are we going to start to reconstruct our landscapes? So it's utterly fundamental for our future. I think the key point from these two slides is really that this is not just important for nature conservation, it's also important for business and for people, local people, and um, particularly their health and wellbeing. Okay, so what about the wider national policy framework that we're currently working with? And it's, as Ed mentioned, I think it's um, all up for, all up for changing grabs at the moment. Nobody's quite sure where we're at in the vacuum of leadership that we've got, political leadership at the moment. But the current framework, um, you know, these are some of the documents that we've got that are shaping the way that we're thinking. Um, this was the setting out the government's ambition to leave the natural environment in a better state than they found it in. And we're very much hoping that that will still be the overarching objective. But there are signs that government are trying to step back from that. And obviously we've got the NPPF, the National Planning Policy Framework. The current government intention is to create a 25 year plan for the environment and for nature. Um, and quite what happens now post Brexit, we're not sure, but I suspect this one will continue and will continue to develop. Um, but the key point to make is that all of those former policies depend upon having good data. And one of the really big issues that we're facing at the moment is that government is tending to use, tr trying to start to use national data sets. And where does that national data come from? It comes from local, locally gathered data information. And the national data sets are only as good as the information that you put in at the beginning. And in the recent, uh, a good example of this is the, re the recent targeting of stewardship um, in the new stewardship scheme. So these are the, the grants which we're no longer going to have because they come from Europe. Who knows what's going to be replaced on? But you know, we've been having because in not 
in some parts of the country where the data hasn't been used, we've come up with some really bad decision making. So the classic example is that the stewardship system in Cumbria, they don't have a local uh, HPA or a local environmental record centre. And they they were advocating planting trees on the top of Paul Bellum, for example, which is completely inappropriate. So you know, all of the de all of the information that goes it feeds into these processes, it may not be it may not appear at first sight to be very sexy or glamorous, but actually it's the bread and butter of good decision making and good, good policy making in the future. Um, and uh, you know, a good example of that is neighborhood planning. And without the information that you're gathering and you have collected, you know, there's no way in which we can ensure that local, the local environment and local wildlife is properly valued and properly taken into consideration in decision making. You know, whether it's about making sure that we plan our, our new housing, the housing requirements that we have in a, in a sensible and sustainable way. Um, whether, whether it's making sure that we have, we integrate wildlife into new development effectively so that we get the benefits for health and wellbeing. And, you know, we know there's really strong evidence, and I think all of us going to be talking about this later, to show that, you know, developments that incorporate the natural environment effectively, sell for higher prices, people want to live there, because you know, houses exchange at a much faster rate than in places that you know, the natural environment isn't of high quality and high value. And we know that people's health and well-being goes up as well. So the, the, the health in just the health divides and the social inequality divides that we see across counties like Warwickshire in terms of um, you know, life expectancy and all the rest of it are related to the quality of the local environment. So how we plan and integrate the natural environment and build on the, these core areas and integrate <coughs> into future plans is absolutely critical and fundamental to the health and well-being of people. And no, there's no better area of activity than uh, young people. And we have a generation that's increasingly alienated from the natural world. All the stats indicate whether they're from uh, government or from the work that some of the NGOs have been doing show that something of the order of um, four out of five children have marginal or no connection with nature whatsoever. So we've, we've, we're producing generations that don't understand <coughs> where our, uh, you know, on what our society is based in terms of its, the, the, you know, the ecosystem services or the, the benefits that the natural world provides. So we're storing up problems unless we can start to provide children with the opportunities to access nature and high quality wildlife sites. Um, and without all of that data that the HBA is producing, how are we going to do that? And then of course we've got you know, the big infrastructure projects. Now I know the HBA has done some fantastic work to help survey and assess you know, the route of HS2 and to help whether whether government and HS2 Limited are going to take notice of it, I, I think the jury is yet out. But um, I think we're making great leaps and strides in providing the evidence base on which those decisions ought to be taken in the future. And the HBA has done some fantastic work to you know to survey the route and to help provide the data and the information that that could be used to produce a really powerful vision for the future environment of HS2 to make the lives of people living along the line and around it much better. You know, if we can design a much more creative and innovative approach to infrastructure like this, then we could get a win-win both in terms of the development and the growth that we need, but also better places for people to live and better places for people to, to recreate and enjoy, as well as being good for wildlife. And, um, Finally, really, I just wanted to draw this together because I think one of the most important things and one of the reasons why the HBA is so pioneering and why Warwickshire should be so proud of what you've been doing is that for all of this to work, you know, we live on a very crowded island. We don't have the space to just have a free-for-all. We need to have a coordinated and integrated approach to the way we use land and look after land and integrate it. And all of the issues that we have in terms of biodiversity, in terms of the need for growth and development can all come together in what we've been calling ecological network mapping. 
which is a bit jargonistic. And I, if anybody has a better a better way of describing this, I'd be delighted to, to hear it because we, we're struggling a bit to, to find a, a better way of explaining it. But what this means really is taking the information that you have been collecting and really bringing it together with the other data sets and properly modeling and planning how we create the networks that we need for nature conservation, but also the networks we need for people. So it's how do we, this is a, an opportunity for us to integrate you know, where, we, where we can put housing, where we can't put housing, how we can design it, where we can put infrastructure. You know, all of these things can come together in these maps because they're incredibly sophisticated tools. And the HBA has been at the cutting edge really of developing um, thinking on this. You know, despite all the difficulties in local government, despite all the difficulties with um, you know, our Brexit and all the rest of it, I think we need to really be positive and say, well, actually, we can create an environment at a local level where it's good for people, good for wildlife, and good for the economy if we embrace ecological network ma mapping and really plan the way that we're going to use our landscapes and uh, manage our land in the future. But it all, again, ultimately depends on good data, good information. And the work that volunteers do on the team, the HBA team, is absolutely outstanding. I just can't praise it enough. It's really wonderful. And it's incredibly good value for money, I think, for the local authorities. And I would, you know, uh, again, praise the local authorities in Warwickshire for, for what you've done to bring this partnership together and sustain this partnership to, to ensure that it's high quality data flows informing decision making across the county. Um, it really is groundbreaking stuff and it really does make a difference to, to the future way in which we can collectively um, reverse those graphs that I showed at the beginning. So many congratulations on your 20, 20 years. It's absolutely wonderful that um, the partnership has been so strong in that time. Here's to the next 20 years and I hope that, you know, that the partnership goes from strength to strength as it has done so far. Thank you very much.